Thank you all for joining us and we'll start the webinar shortly. Thank you for joining us. We will start the webinar shortly. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar. I'm Wafa El Sadr. I'm the Global Director for ICAP at Columbia University, and I welcome you today uh, to this webinar. Uh, this webinar is um, a collaboration uh, between uh, two entities here at Columbia University. Um, the series of webinars was established um, to in collaboration between ICAP at Columbia University, a global health center situated at the Mailman School of Public Health that's focusing on transforming the health of populations through innovation, science, and global collaboration. And the other partner is the Herbert Irving uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center at Columbia University, which is, as, uh, is a home for cancer research patient care at Columbia University, as well as at the uh, New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. We launched this uh, collaboration, this initiative, the ICAP Cancer Center Initiative uh, in 2021. And our goal is to, uh, to advance the training, research, education, and programs that are really focused on cancer detection, prevention, and management uh, in low and middle income countries. Now let me move to today's uh, webinar. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Sinead Delaney Muratloy, who will be our speaker today uh, at this webinar. Now I'll give you a little bit of a, of a background uh, on Dr. Delaney Muratloy. Uh, she is the director for research at the WITS uh, uh, Reproductive Health Initiative. She's a professor of global health and infectious disease at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. She's had a long-standing research career uh, with uh, interest in the intersection between sexual reproductive health, infectious diseases, particularly with a focus on adolescent girls and young women in Sub-Saharan Africa. She was the lead investigator in several uh, a phase three trials of new HIV prevention technologies. And of course, she was the chair of the landmark trial uh, that demonstrated the efficacy uh, of long acting cabotegravir uh, for as a long acting injectable prep for women in sub Saharan Africa. She's also had a long standing uh, career in implementing implementation science studies of oral prep in adolescent girls and young women in Eastern and Southern Africa and has done also studies uh, most relevant to today's uh, conversation, evaluating uh, uh, HPV screening vaccination approaches for populations living with HIV, as well as studies of novel treatments and vaccines for gonorrhea. She's recognized as an expert. She's an advisor to the South African National Department of Health, the PrEP Technical Working Group, and also serves on several WHO and other advisory groups around the world. Today, uh, Dr. Muratwe uh, will be focusing um, on, uh, on, on the topic of today's conversation, which is going to be the focus on the HPV vaccine. I encourage you all to submit your questions in the chat, uh, and we will take at the end of her presentation uh, some of your questions and engage with her in a conversation regarding her research, as well as also the implications of her research for the programs uh, for HPV prevention and management moving forward. Thank you very much and uh, welcome, Sinead. Thank you very much, Wafa, and thanks very much for that uh, introduction. 
Um, I'm just going to share my my screen. Sorry, just putting up the presentation. Okay. Hopefully you can see that in presenter mode. It looks good. Go ahead. Okay, great. All right. Um, well, thanks very much for the kind invitation. Uh, what I hope to really do is speak a little bit about why cervical cancer elimination is a priority, particularly in low and middle income countries, and the tools we have to tackle those elimination goals, um, but also um, have a conversation about sort of some of the challenges to implementation in low and middle income countries, and then what we know particularly about evaluating impact of vaccination in uh, low and middle income countries using our experience from South Africa as an example. So just to remind you all um, about uh, the burden of cervical cancer, uh, about um, 600,000 new cases were recorded uh, in 2020 and just over 300,000 deaths were recorded, which is an estimated mortality rate of about 7.2 deaths per 100,000 women years. And that mortality rate really ranges from about one per 100,000 uh, in a place like Switzerland to about uh, 56 per 100,000 in Eswatini, which is just next door to South Africa. So a real um, diversity. Uh, and similarly, incidence also uh, tracks that same sort of uh, geographic or difference in, in, in incidence by region. Uh, and essentially, these rates appear to uh, be associated, the higher incidence and mortality rates are associated with lower human development indexes, according to the World Bank. So just to remind you that cervical cancer is caused by a human papillomavirus. Uh, in people who have normal human cytology, uh, uh, normal cervical cytology, uh, the prevalence of HPV is about 11 to 12% globally, with type 16 and 18 being the most common uh, uh, HPV types detected, and they are also associated with about 70% of cervical cancers. Men tend to have slightly higher prevalence than women, but uh, they are less likely to have persistent uh, infection. And then just to remind you of the relationship between HPV infection and the development of cervical cancer, uh, uh, HPV is a ubiquitous infection. Uh, it's generally acquired um, with uh, the initiation of sexual activity in young people. Uh, and the majority of people will clear infection within uh, 12 to 18 months but a small proportion will go on to develop persistent infection. And if that uh, persistent infection is not treated, they can go on to develop precancerous lesions. And those precancerous lesions, uh, many of you know, are called, uh, we define them as cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, and there are sort of three levels of that. And by the time you develop uh, uh, SIN2, uh, if untreated, that will likely become cancer. Uh, but the reason to dwell on this natural history is that the long period between infection, you can see that age 15, all the way through to the development of cancer much later on, several decades later, really provides opportunities to intervene, both to uh, screen for precancerous lesions, but also potentially to prevent infection through vaccination. So one of the questions is why do we see such high rates of cervical cancer in sub-Saharan Africa in particular? And here is data summarizing an analysis uh, looking at the population attributable fraction of um, uh, cervical cancer that could be attributed to HIV. And what you can see very much in sub-Saharan Africa is that uh, there is a, a nearly 
two thirds of cervical cancers can be attributed to people living with HIV. And the overall risk for cervical cancer among women living with HIV was estimated to be sixfold higher compared to those without HIV. And part of the reason for this is that women with uh, HIV, particularly if they're immunocompromised, have a higher risk of um, acquiring high-risk HPV infection. They often have multiple high-risk types. Uh, because of their um, immune status, they may not be able to clear persistent infection. They often have more rapid progression to uh, cervical cancer and less frequent uh, regression of those lesions. And here is just some uh, of the studies that have been done to kind of demonstrate this um, higher incidence and lower clearance. Um, it's also important to note that often um, then uh, infection is associated with younger age at presentation and people living with HIV often have recurrence after treatment. And one of the important things therefore is that actually early initiation of antiretroviral therapy is an important uh, cervical cancer elimination control strategy because of the, the um, synergies between these uh, two infections. So the second reason why uh, we may see such a higher burden of cervical cancer, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, in addition to the overlap with uh, a, um, high HIV burden settings, is also that prevention relies predominantly up until fairly recently on the implementation of um, um, screening, either through pap smear or visual inspection with acetic acid, or more recently with detection of HPV infection. But in this analysis, looking at lifetime cervical cancer screening coverage, uh, it was estimated that two thirds of women aged 20 to 70 years had never been screened. And an estimated 9% of women 30 to 49 years of age uh, living in uh, low and middle income country, countries had ever been screened compared to 84% who'd been screened in high income countries. So there are disparities in access to screening, particularly in low and middle income countries, which means that early lesions remain undetected. And uh, this is just uh, a, a data from a study that was done in South Africa, looking at uh, who uh, using the DHS, who had reported uh, pap smear screening compared to who, who hadn't. Uh, and there, was, there were interesting sort of disparities by a province with um, overall findings that people with higher educational attainment, highest wealth quintiles and health insurance were more likely to have pap smear uh, access to pap smears. So in addition to there being country level disparities in access to cervical cancer screening, even within countries, there are, are uh, differences in access. And very much it appears that uh, wealth is associated with better access. And why is this, uh, and I think sort of more importantly, even if women do have access to a screening, uh, that is really an entry point into uh, the need for an intervention uh, if, if there are abnormal findings uh, at screening. And this is data that came from a study that WHO did really looking at whether we could just implement cervical cancer screening using visual inspection with acetic acid, which really has limitations. But even in that context with a very uh, point of care intervention, only about 40% uh, or sort of one in five women had actually same day cryotherapy. And about half of women in that study returned for treatment one year later. Uh, and of those with possible cancer, only a third were investigated. So there are a number of health systems challenges to really implementing effective cervical cancer screening in low and middle income countries. And this is one of the reasons why we see such high rates of cervical cancer. So the, the, the obvious uh, opportunity here is to uh, develop a vaccine that could potentially prevent infection because that would certainly uh, potentially be easier to implement than uh, screening, which is already secondary prevention. And I think one of the sort of surprises uh, in terms of vaccine development was in fact the success of the uh, human papilloma virus. Um, the virus essentially is based on uh, virus-like particles, which 
uh, the, the L1 proteins self-assemble to um, form a VLP. And these VLPs are highly immunogen immunogenic, probably because of their highly repetitive structure. Uh, and what we know is that HPV is highly susceptible to a neutralizing antibody and hence the success of this vaccine. So in the early 2000s, what we saw were several trials that reported high efficacy um, of these uh, L1 VLP vaccines against HPV 16 and 18. And for at least two of the vaccines against uh, type 6 and 11, which cause anogenital warts. And more recently, we've seen uh, an expansion of the quadrivalent vaccine to include additional types. And all of these vaccines have very high uh, efficacy when administered to people who are HPV naive. So what do we know about the impact of these vaccines? Well, there is data that has come from a systematic review looking at um, uh, studies that have reported the impact of vaccination uh, on uh, a range of parameters associated with HPV disease. But the first of these really looked at the impact of vaccination on prevalence. And what you can see is that the greatest impact is in girls who received the vaccine aged 13 to 19 years. Um, and that with time, perhaps there is less of an impact, um, but nevertheless, that impact is associated with impacts on type 16 and 18. And we don't see the same effects for non-vaccine types, suggesting that these benefits are related to the vaccine. So importantly, uh, in addition to just preventing HPV infection, what we've actually seen are impacts on uh, SYN2 plus lesions, uh, the precancerous lesions. And so in populations who had received the vaccine, um, so in the target ages, and, and the vaccine is usually delivered to nine to 14 year olds, there have been significant declines in um, those populations uh, who received the vaccine with respect to reports of SYN2 plus whereas in groups that would have been age ineligible for the vaccine, there don't appear to have been changes in, in precancerous lesions. And in fact, uh, in the last couple of years, we have seen reports uh, of the effects of national vaccination programs on cervical cancer. And this is data that was reported by the UK where they had uh, an extensive vaccination program. Uh, and what they did was compare uh, cervical cancer rates in the pre-vaccine cohort, so prior, born prior to 1990, uh, and then compared them with age cohorts uh, who were 16 to 18 years old when they received the vaccine, those who were 14 to 16, and then the 12 to 13 year olds who would have received uh, vaccination after August 95. And what you can see is really kind of declining rates of cervical cancer in these younger age cohorts that have been exposed to vaccination, such that when compared to the birth cohorts that had no exposure to vaccine, uh, there was an 87% risk reduction for cervical cancer in those who received the vaccine uh, when they were aged 12 to 13 years. So really impressive uh, effects of these uh, this vaccination uh, coming from high-income countries. Uh, what we've also seen is not, not just impacts on cervical cancer, but similar benefits in terms of uh, prevention or protection against anogenital warts. Uh, and what's also been interesting is data from Australia uh, looking at the question of herd protection. And uh, what they looked at was uh, their vaccination program was uh, introduced in 2007. And they looked at uh, diagnosis of anogenital warts in groups that had uh, anogenital warts diagnosed in the period 2004 to 2011. So prior to vaccination and then after vaccination. And what they saw were significant reductions in uh, ano reports of anogenital warts in men aged less than 21 years who would have been considered to be the likely sexual partners of young women who would have received the vaccination, suggesting that the benefits um, that women may get from vaccination can actually be passed on to their heterosexual partners. So the um, really impressive uh, impacts of the HPV vaccination had prompted sort of in 
in 2018, the WHO Director General to begin to envisage the idea of cervical cancer elimination. Um, and that is really uh, um, seeing age-adjusted incidence rates of under 4% uh, in, ac across the world. Uh, and in order to achieve that, setting targets for countries to achieve 90% vaccination of, of um, all eligible girls by 15 years of age uh, by 2030, and then 70% of eligible women screened and 90% of women who have cervical disease uh, receive treatment or care. And this is uh, aligned to the SDG targets of 30% uh, reduction in mortality from NCDs. So these initial discussions began in 2018 and in 2020, the World Health uh, Assembly adopted these targets. And uh, so we have the cervical cancer elimination targets for 2030. So how are we doing in respect to those targets, particularly with respect to um, HPV vaccination? So here is a snapshot in 2023. Uh, of all the countries that have introduced national HPV vaccination programs. And what is encouraging is to see many countries in the African region have uh, implemented national programs. Um, and some have uh, at least completed demonstration projects or have uh, planned introdu introductions in the next year. But still many countries in the region uh, have no program. And uh, in a meta-analysis done in in 2020, it was estimated that about half of member states have actually, actually introduced HPV vaccination with the most introductions in LMICs in 2019. And that was prior to the COVID pandemic. But really, you know, COVID derailed these uh, introductions, both because of uh, the obvious uh, lockdowns, uh, um, repurposing of staff and EPI programs, but also independently there have been supply constraints which have uh, delayed some of these introductions. So still a ways to go if we want to uh, achieve those elimination targets. So how are we doing in terms of the coverage targets that have been set of 90% coverage of age eligible girls by age 15. Uh, and uh, the headline news is that in 2019, only five countries had actually achieved that target with the average coverage of the first dose being about 67% and a big drop off uh, with uh, both doses to 53%. And if you look at the graph uh, on the right, you'll see the comparing high-income countries with low-income countries, the low-income countries actually did better with first-dose coverage, but there's significant dropout with uh, second-dose coverage in, in low-income countries. Uh, and another important finding from this analysis was really that schools-based and single cohort delivery strategies perform better, which may explain why the low-income countries uh, appear to do better with the, the first dose because this is an approach they may be more familiar with. So there are a number of challenges to implementing uh, HP or introducing HPV vaccination into countries as well as sort of achieving those coverage targets. The first is the cost of the vaccine. Uh, it's the highest price per dose of UNICEF vaccines. The second is really the delivery cost because this is uh, delivery to uh, an age group that is not covered by the traditional EPI schedule uh, and uh, often involves um, sort of coordination, not just with, within the Department of Health, but with the Department of Basic Education. There's also a delivery complexity, and you saw that with those progress data, that because of the multi-visit dosing, so usually two doses within a year, um, that that can uh, lead to additional challenges. And as I mentioned, there have been supply constraints um, and then the disruption associated with COVID to schools, but also to the health system, as well as I think sort of a concern, at least for us in Sub-Saharan Africa, is this growing vaccine hesitancy uh, has the potential really to uh, undermine the progress that had been achieved by 2019. So I suppose the question for today is what do we know about HPV vaccine impact in low and middle income countries, given what I showed you earlier on about uh, impacts of the vaccine, vaccine in high income countries? 
And the short answer is that we know a lot less, partly because many countries have only just introduced programs uh, uh, or, or are still to introduce. But I thought it would be useful to share an example of what we're doing in South Africa for how we're trying to understand the potential impact of vaccination on HPV 1618 prevalence. So just uh, in case you're not aware, South Africa introduced its HPV vaccination program in 2014. Um, the program has to date uh, used a bivalent vaccine, which is delivered um, in, through a campaign style approach at schools uh, in March and September of every year. So it's a school-based delivery. Initially, it was targeted at nine-year-olds uh, and now in grade four, uh, for logistic reasons that actually has been shifted to grade five to ensure better coverage of all nine-year-olds. And what we have seen over the um, time since the vaccine was introduced is that second dose coverage is a challenge. And this is uh, data from WHO just showing you relatively good uh, coverage early on in the program with the first dose, but you can see much lower coverage of the second dose in blue. And obviously in 2020, just COVID blew up that program. So we think that South Africa provides a unique opportunity to answer some important questions about the population level effectiveness of an HPV vaccine in preventing infection. And that's because the South African program targets a very young age group of nine-year-olds um, and also is one of the few uh, African countries to to use a bivalent vaccine, which uh, the advantage of the bivalent vaccine, although it doesn't cover anogenital warts, it may have greater cross protection. And also South Africa is unique because of its uh, huge inequalities and health disparities, but also because it's a high HIV burden setting. And it's a really important consideration whether the impacts that we see in uh, people uh, not living with HIV are translated into people living with HIV. Uh, and in addition, we also consider that my, it might be an opportunity to answer questions about the effectiveness of a one dose program, given the challenges we have with delivering two doses every year. So why uh, is it of interest to measure population level impact? Uh, well, the data that we get from randomized controlled trials is really critical for demonstrating vaccine safety and also efficacy uh, under perfect conditions. Uh, but often the criteria for enrollment in trials is fairly restrictive, such as not having prior HPV exposure and may not reflect sort of the real world diversity. Uh, and real world effectiveness studies can complement the RCT data by providing a better overall picture of sort of benefit at a population level, which we hope gives us insights into what, what this may mean for precancerous lesions and cervical cancer, which are more challenging to measure, particularly in LMICs where registries may be, may be inadequate and, and, and tracking some of these other longer term impacts uh, may, may take a while when the target population for vaccination is so young. So the approach um, that's been taken with vaccine effectiveness studies is to use repeat surveys of HPV prevalence. And this is because it really gives you insights within a fairly short window of time of sort of what's happening to HPV 1618 prevalence. Um, this is because HPV is a very common sexually transmitted infection and it's acquired fairly soon after sexual debut. Uh, and the idea really is that it, you can compare that prevalence across both uh, across bo birth cohorts. Uh, and so by comparing sort of uh, un, uh, or birth cohorts that wouldn't have been exposed to the vaccine with those that have, you can uh, draw assumptions about what the potential impact of the vaccine is. And this approach was first used uh, in Australia to, to demonstrate the impact of their vaccination program. Um, and here is an example of the Australian data. They did a, um, a survey in a birth cohort that weren't age eligible for vaccination. Uh, and then they did a survey that's the red bar five years later and another one, the green bar 10 years later. And what they showed is that uh, although there weren't uh, any differences between the HPV types that were non-vaccine types, so looking at this red circle, 
what they were able to show is that when you looked at uh, differences um, by birth cohort of HPV type 16 and 18, 6 and 11, which are the vaccine associated types, they showed a 77% reduction uh, in, in those vaccine associated types within four years of introducing the program. And within almost 10 years of introducing the program, they'd seen a 94% population level reduction. And this is, makes sense. We expect the vaccine, the, the, the program to impact vaccine specific types and not to impact other high risk types. And that's what these cross section, that, that's what a study using cross sectional surveys was able to demonstrate. So the important thing when using these cross sectional surveys is really that they need to be conducted in young women who are likely to be sexually active. So the setting in which these studies is conducted is important. And you need to be able to repeat the surveys over time so that the comparisons you make uh, are not um, confounded by sort of differences in population or population behavior. Um, and the sampling methods also, it's important that they're acceptable to the population so you're able to get reasonable uh, measurement across sort of representative populations. So while clinician collected samples might be optimal, many of these surveys have actually opted for self-collected swabs, which are seen to be acceptable to these young populations. And so this is the design that we are using in South Africa to evaluate our two-dose vaccination program. And what you can see is uh, we introduced, uh, if you look along the x-axis, you can see the years. And if you look along the y-axis, you can see the age. So in 2014, the first vaccination cohort was age nine and they received their vaccination. And now in 2023, they have aged up and they're age 17 or 18. So in 2019, we did a baseline survey in the similar 17 to 18 year old population. We chose 17 to 18 because the median age of sexual debut in South Africa is 17. And so we would likely detect infection in people who were sexually active. Uh, and the idea here is to essentially compare HPV 16, 18 prevalence in the unvaccinated or pre-vaccine cohort from 2019 with a sample that are surveyed in 2023 uh, to compare infection rates and therefore make interpretations about um, the impact of the program at a population level. The other thing we did was because we were interested in the potential impact of a one dose program was that we identified, uh, um, we conducted, uh, we identified a district in South Africa uh, and we offered vaccination to all girls in that district who wouldn't have been age eligible for the uh, HPV vaccination program. So they would have been too old in 2019. Um, for, for the vaccination program when it was introduced sort of when they were nine years old. And then that age group aged up two years in 2021. And, and so they were 17 and 18 in 2021. And we surveyed them and um, basically estimated the HPV 16, 18 prevalence in that group and compared it to the baseline to make assumptions about the population effectiveness of a one dose program. So a little bit more about these surveys, they're conducted in Sentinel clinics in four provinces. Uh, the one dose uh, catch up was only done in one of these provinces. And the reason these provinces were selected is that they all had clinics that had adolescent and youth friendly services. They all were in districts that are part of the priority districts for our HIV program. And they were all in provinces where there was reasonable HPV vaccination coverage sort of starting in 2014. And the surveys that have run since 2019, every two years, essentially enroll all young women presenting to primary health care services uh, who are aged 17 to 18 years old. Um, they provide consent for all study procedures, so uh, parental consent is not required. Um, and it's, it's focused purely on young women and doesn't include young men because 
they are the primary targets of vaccination. But we do aim to um, assess potentially uh, herd immunity effects. So just to give you an idea, these surveys uh, include both uh, young people living with HIV and not living with HIV. And each survey has involved sort of around a thousand participants. Uh, and these uh, survey assumptions are really based on assumptions that the HPV prevalence in this age group is going to be between 19 and 30 percent. And that's based on sort of published literature and looking at sort of it stratified by HIV status and making assumptions about the impacts of the vaccine based on the meta-analyses, which have shown, you know, kind of at least a 40 percent, if not greater impact, even with low coverage. Um, and these sample sizes also account for the possibility that at least a third of these participants could be sexually act could have been sexually active at the time of vaccination, and therefore um, there might have been some um, moderation, therefore, of the efficacy effectiveness of the vaccine. So the surveys um, have taken place. Uh, in 2019, 2021, and we are starting up again in 2023. Essentially, participants provide consent. They do a tablet-based computer-assisted self-interview that collects data on sexual behavior and vaccine vaccination history. The research nurse also collects additional um, data from participant records on whether or not they've been uh, tested for HIV or on antiretroviral therapy. And if they haven't, participants are offered HIV testing and linkage to care. And then the young woman is shown how to do a self-collected swab. Uh, the swabs are collected and then they're sent to a central laboratory uh, in Cape Town and now in Johannesburg to do testing using the C-gene in Aniplex. And uh, the laboratories have done, used the WHO proficiency panel and also there is an EQA uh, procedure that is performed. So just to give you some insights into the baseline results, in 2019, we screened 910 participants. We only had four invalid laboratory results. One of the important things to do was to validate, in fact, their vaccination history. Some of the participants uh, who, were, uh, who reported vaccination actually had also participated in our one-dose catch-up campaign. Um, and so, a number were uh, excluded, uh, but what's been important is to verify vaccination status against vaccination regi registers because a number of participants think they've had the HPV vaccination, but they probably have had other vaccines like the tetanus booster. And so it's important to use the registers actually to validate that. And we do that using uh, matching analysis. So here is the baseline data. This is in a population that would have been age ineligible for vaccination. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, any HPV or high risk HPV. But what's of interest to us really is the prevalence of HPV 16 or 18. This is our baseline. So people who were living with HIV had a twofold higher rate of HPV 16 or 18 compared to those who are HIV uninfected. And other risks for HPV 16 and 18 were having two or more partners. So in terms of what we know about the impact, population impact of the two-dose vaccination, that uh, will, we will evaluate this year when we're about to go out into the field and begin the, the surveys for the two-dose uh, eligible group. So this is the group that would have been nine years old in 2014 and now are um, will be coming to clinics because they're sexually active and we will invite them to participate in the survey. So we'll have data on the two-dose program toward the end of this year. And you may also have some questions about what we know about the single dose, uh, um, the, the population effectiveness of single dose. Well, just to say we vaccinated uh, just under 7,000 uh, or rather, yeah, just under um, 6,000 young women. Um, uh, about a quarter weren't vaccinated largely because of the Department of Health requirements for consent from parents. Uh, and these data include it. So impacts on HPV 16 and 18 prevalence by HIV status will be presented at the papillomavirus meeting in April.
So in summary, um, cervical cancer is a preventable disease. A disproportionate burden of disease is experienced in low and middle income countries. And this is because screening and vaccination programs are not yet delivered at scale or optimally. Um, evaluating the population level impact of HPV vaccination programs in resource limited settings using these repeat cross-sectional surveys is valuable potentially um, and relatively low cost, but provides important insights into the impact of these vaccines in countries where age, HIV status uh, and type of vaccine used uh, may differ from what we've seen in high income countries. And these data ultimately are going to be important for guiding the Global Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative, uh, particularly in those countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So just want to acknowledge all the people who have contributed to this work and thank you very much for your attention. Great. And thank you very much, Sinead, uh, for this excellent uh, presentation. And I invite uh, all of our participants today to please submit your uh, questions you have in the, um, in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with one question, uh, Sinead, which is, um, as you look at these different cohorts over time, uh, how do you uh, take into account any um, uh, changes in um, sexual behaviors over time? Yeah, that's a great question, Wafa, and it particularly concerned us uh, when we went into the field to do the survey in 2021, because that was in the middle of the COVID pandemic, and we understood that there might have been uh, impacts uh, on sexual behavior in young people. But one of the things that makes these um, uh, or one of the things that helps us really to make those assessments when we do these comparisons across the a, the birth cohorts is that if we see, imp, like I showed you with the Australian data, if we see impacts on type specific uh, mm -hmm. vaccine types, but not on the non-vaccine types, that's mm -hmm. very reassuring because it suggests that we are seeing vaccine effects. But also in the analyses, if there are differences in behavior across the surveys, we adjust for that um, just to make sure that we, we are not we are controlling for any confounding by sexual behavior. Mm, that's great. I mean, another question is, and you showed us data on, uh, you know, how difficult the, uh, to achieve uh, sufficient coverage with the second dose. Um, uh, so having uh, demonstrating uh, a one dose eff effectiveness would be very interesting. So how do you see your study um, that you're doing adding to the current uh, body of evidence um, to support one dose effectiveness? Yeah, I think the question around one dose is really going to be critical for scaling up vaccination in low and middle income countries. And we have great data from two trials, one that was conducted in India, India and one in Kenya that have shown vaccine effectiveness uh, levels of sort of greater than 90%. And th those are in well controlled trials. I think what the, the HOPE study can add, that's the study in South Africa, is that it can provide um, insights into how those um, high eff uh, effectiveness levels translate into kind of population level impact. Mm -hmm. uh, but importantly, none of those trials included um, people living with HIV. Mm -hmm. So the data on people living with HIV is gonna be really important. And I think many people are anxious that uh, given the current recommendations of vaccination for people living with HIV, that you know, kind of if there are differences, we may it may make our programs complicated. So I think that's going to be an important insight from from Hope. Yeah, no, that would be very important, um, particularly in Southern Africa, I would imagine. Um, another question is, um, as you're well aware, and many I'm sure on this uh, webinar are aware that uh, January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and um, that's one of the reasons for having this webinar. Uh, but when you think about the um, uh, the programming in a country like South Africa and the challenges uh, moving forward, uh, one of the uh, suggestions or questions in, uh, from one of our attendees is, is uh, what about um, you know technology transfer and the ability to uh, produce this vaccine at low cost in low middle income countries? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think before COVID, it might have been a more difficult conversation. You know, um, sort of prior to COVID, there already was a forecast that there would be global supply constraints. And also, as we've seen with COVID, sort of this difference uh, where high income countries can afford to introduce gender neutral programs, uh, mm -hmm. while, you know, low and middle income countries are not able to introduce anything. Um, I know that there are a number of vaccines that are already being um, developed uh, with Chinese and and potentially Indian partners, and that certainly creates opportunities to expand access. And then I think, although um, the HPV vaccine is not an mRNA vaccine, I really think the investments in these vaccine hubs mm -hmm. and the sensitization around the need for, for regional manufacturing certainly sort of and the need for tech transfer has certainly opened up conversations that were not there before. Yes, uh, agreed. And hopefully this will uh, provide the momentum uh, to try and do this for, for other vaccines, as you indicate. Um, one of the, uh, one we have a question that uh, is getting at the, uh, what about vaccination in older women uh, who screen negative for HPV? What are your thoughts on that? So I think um, the first thing is that uh, the study suggested vaccinating young women just because they were more likely to be HPV naive. But mm -hmm. people who are older, who are HPV naive, would obviously derive benefit. And then even people who've had prior exposure may derive benefit. I think the issue is one of um, sort of public funded programs where mm -hmm. rather than individual benefit, where countries have really had to decide how are they going to provide benefits. So a place like Australia had a very wide catch up through to age 26. But what we're seeing in countries like South Africa and other countries in the African region is that they just can't afford those large catch up groups, um, which might be why we see sort of delayed impacts. Mm -hmm. um, but sort of uh, on an individual level, there there is potentially value. And I think the one population where there might be greater value and, and there has been some work to sort of define this as women who enter screening programs where they use the HPV test and if they're 16 and 18 negative, could they be offered uh, HPV vaccination, particularly if they're living with HIV? Yeah, that seems to me that would be a group that would be a high priority to vaccinate, uh, certainly if they're HPV negative, yeah. Another question is, um, you know, about the, um, the 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 design of these studies and the ethical dilemma of um, of um, essentially using a less than the optimal dosing regimen um, in studies um, to determine, you know, fewer doses or uh, different kinds of dosing regimen. What are your thoughts in terms of how to uh, be able to answer these very important questions, one at the same time? being attentive to ethical concerns? Yeah, it's a great question. And I uh, I think uh, in the trials, certainly in one of the trials, uh, there was a, the trial was planned to sort of offer full course vaccination and the, the Indian government actually shut down the program. And so it was a sort of it was an accident, in fact, that we had populations of people who had one, two, and three doses of vaccine already received. Mm. My understanding of the Kenyan study is that there was always the potential to go back and offer an additional dose. And in our study, the, the one dose catch up was really offered as a benefit to people who missed vaccination because they were too old uh, when the program was introduced. But we also had rules for if we saw sort of lower than expected population impact based on the reviews I showed you that we would go back and offer a second dose. So I think in all of these situations, careful consideration is given to how to sort of maximize benefit for, for populations in the, in the studies. Mm -hmm. I like this, um, the focusing on the catch up idea. Yep. Um, and then another question is, um, uh, what are your thoughts are in terms of the usefulness or even feasibility of including HPV vaccines in the primary series of, of uh, immunizations overall? So you mean sort of thinking about it for a younger age group? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, 
And um, I know there's been a lot of interest in that and um, you know, some studies done sort of potentially looking at this. I think the real concern is what do we know about the duration of protection? So mm -hmm. some of the data that um, we do have comes from the studies done in Costa Rica looking at um, where they did trials there, where they still are following up participants and are able to sort of show impacts out to, I think they've got to 12 years now, possibly longer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of, but the question ultimately is if you vaccinate sort of when someone is aged zero, uh, their sort of period of exposure is age 17. So I think there's some anxiety that if we see waning uh, uh, protection, that we may miss the period when when they are likely to be mm -hmm. uh, sort of most in need of protection, and that's probably one, been one of the anxieties for why the age hasn't been been sort of walked back into the EPI schedule. Yeah, and I think this um, your response and certainly the question lends itself to another question here regarding uh, what do we know about the durability of protection uh, from these vaccines. Yeah, so what's been very interesting is the data from the Costa Rica studies uh, where, in fact, they also sort of had some people who had one, two or three doses just based on whether or not they sort of returned for follow up or if they had been pregnant at the time of their second dose. And what they have done is to really monitor uh, participants over many years looking at, um, they've, they've also looked at sort of protection against infection, but they've continued to do um, so, uh, sort of immunogenicity studies in that population. And what we can see is that the antibody levels really just kind of stay flat for many, many years. So upwards of 12, you know, kind of years or longer. And so it's starting to suggest to people that this protection is likely lifelong because this vaccine is so immunogenic and because and the antibody teeters that we see from vaccination are so much higher than those that might be generated for natural infection so there is a strong belief that you know kind of we likely have a fairly prolonged duration of protection but i th you know that that probably people will feel more comfortable if we can continue to see that sort of for an even longer period Mm -hmm. And you're right. I mean, I think the issue is uh, when does uh, when when is maximum protection offered um, in the context of when highest risk uh, for the exactly yeah yeah. Another question is uh, what about young men? What about male and uh, use of this vaccine in in males and studies in in any studies in in males in low middle income countries. No, I think that's a great question. And I think we have data that is showing that uh, you, although not at sort of the rates that we see cervical cancer, we certainly see anogenital cancers yeah. in young men. And what we also see are is, is a sort of in, what appears to be an increase in oropharyngeal cancers, yeah. uh, which are not the typical cancer seen in, in older populations, but in young men. Uh, and this appears to be associated with HPV and likely because of uh, changing sexual behaviors in the last two to three decades. And so, you know, kind of there is a strong argument for offering uh, gender neutral vaccination. Again, I think it's been a cost calculation for many countries with the primary goal being uh, prevention of cervical cancer given the significant burden of disease, but many countries have started to shift to gender neutral vaccination, the high income countries. And it was certainly, I think, have the potential if we have a one dose uh, program to kind of then use the second dose potentially to offer to, to young men to prevent those other cancers uh, in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some ways- There is also the, sorry, and the, I mean, the other point is that men are not completely, uh, it, uh, it's not as if they have no benefit. There is the, the, the herd protection that we've seen from some countries uh, where vac uh, partners of vaccinated co age cohorts um, derive some protection, but this is really sort of as one would expect in heterosexual populations. So there's an argument that 
some populations, if they're not having sex with women, they won't be protected. And that, that's an important group to protect. So hence the kind of drive to expand vaccinations to young men. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I think this um, highlights how everything is really, all these challenges are interconnected, the, the cost, the supply, the availability, which drives, of course, which population you can reach and, uh, and uh, with how many doses of the vaccine. Um, another question, uh you need is, I'm sorry, go ahead. You had something to add. <laughs> no, I just wanted to agree with you. I mean, oftentimes we have great technology, but it's uh, getting it to the people who need it most that represents the, the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, but, but here is a great technology. And I think the Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative really focuses the mind to ensure that we can kind of achieve those targets in these high burden settings. Yeah. And then maybe a last question, since we're running out of time, is um, a question from one of uh, the, from the audience is, is it possible to measure HPV antibody response and what method is used? Yes. Yeah, so uh, in fact, in our study, we have done a sub study to measure antibody responses uh, to understand whether there are differences in uh, antibody response by HIV status. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are also assays that can be used to assess functional status. I think there is some debate about sort of what these kind of absolute values mean. There is a sort of much more probably of a qualitative interpretation of the values. Um, uh, and it differs by type. So it's a sort of complex uh, assessment. But it does, the, those assays have been used in in studies to kind of assess uh, differences in vaccine response by HIV status uh, and are useful at least for helping us to kind of understand what might be um, Im di uh, differences in immune response by HIV status. And the other place it's been used is actually assessments by age. And this, uh, there was a nice study that showed that people under the age of 15 probably generated higher antibody responses. And that's one of the reasons to actually encourage vaccination under the age of 18, because you get a, a sort of higher response to the vaccine in terms of immune response. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sinead. This has been a, a wonderful uh, presentation, I think, and bringing us up to date in terms of where we're at in terms of this important um, momentum towards trying to really eliminate cervical cancer. Um, I think as we are observing Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, I, um, I think it's uh, incumbent on all of us to think of ways in which we can contribute to achieving this effort, whether it be through um, advocacy to reduce price or uh, technology transfer or doing the, the kind of research that you're doing. Uh, I think uh, all of these um, interventions are, are very critically important if we're gonna achieve what we need to achieve. Um, Thank you again, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, and um, stay tuned for our next uh, webinar um, that will uh, again be part of this series uh, in partnership between ICAP and the Columbia Cancer Center. Thank you all and have a good day. Thank you.